Let us pray. Gracious God, give us the courage to ask that our hearts of stone be made into hearts of flesh. Grant us that we would grow in compassion for all those we meet. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On Ash Wednesday, we began our journey through Lent. It was a different sort of Ash Wednesday in terms of our scripture reading. Normally, we begin with a reading from Joel about needing to repent, and then we move on to Jesus telling us how we are to practice our spirituality. He tells us, by the way, that we aren't supposed to make a show of our religiosity and our righteousness. We are to pray and to give in secret, and God who sees in secret will know what we have done. This year we added a reading from Genesis, and it was a rather strange reading for Lent. It has nothing to do with Jesus being compelled to go into the desert. Rather, it was the story of Abram, who later becomes Abraham, who, with his wife, his nephew, and all the people he acquired, was called to leave his home and journey through the desert. We probably don't talk enough about that call. It was a call every bit as wild as Jesus telling Peter, James, and John to come, follow me. It was a call to leave safety and security and intentionally go into the desert and follow where God led, even if there was no road map. There was only a promise that God would make Abram's offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and that all people would be blessed through him. So Abram, his wife, his nephew, and all those people he had acquired went. And while this isn't a sermon about acquiring people, I think we would do well to take a moment and acknowledge that our holy scriptures The stories that inform who we are and how we believe, except that some people are enslaved and others are enslavers. The scriptures are steeped in the culture in which they were written, and while it should be horrifying for us reading today to think of people as property, how many of our employers see us not as humans, but as resources? And how many times has the act of enslaving others been justified as biblical? We must pause when we read this and we must look at how the tradition has been used not to spread the gospel, but to keep subjugated people in their place. As we enter into the desert where God has called us to dwell for these 40 days, We must seek to uncover the places where we are held enslaved and the places where our hearts of stone have turned against others, enslaving them in the web of power, influence, poverty, and addiction that our society has woven and has called normal or necessary for the preservation of our way of life. If we enter that desert, We will have to wrestle with how our hearts of stone will grow in compassion. (laughs) And that is dangerous business. That wrestling is what has led millions of people out of churches that preach a false gospel. That wrestling has driven people to the edges of society. We have hardened our hearts because if we are to live in this world as it is, We have to protect ourselves against the pain of knowing just how opposed to the kingdom of God our lives are. We have to form a shield around ourselves to protect our soft underbelly, just like those pesky armadillos that destroy our yards do. But we are not called to roll up into a ball and protect ourselves. Indeed, like Abram, we are called to venture out into the world. Like Jesus, we are called into the desert by the Spirit so that we can wrestle with the questions of whose will will we enact? 
Whose vision for the world will we embrace? Will we embrace the vision of our society, which tells us some people are more important than others, and that we should have all the good things we can get? Or will we hear the still, small voice of God telling us to see the person who has nothing and to share our bread with them? Because if we have more than enough, we have stolen from them. The passage that we read today comes from the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel lived and worked in the time when the Jewish people were exiled from the land of Israel. They had been captured by the Babylonians in the temple. The temple had been destroyed in 586. And Ezekiel had a word of judgment and of comfort for the exiled people. You see, he was both a priest and a prophet. The priest's job was to work in the temple on behalf of the people of God. The prophet's job was to speak truth to power, to challenge the political leaders, and to call the people back to worshiping God. Ezekiel is perhaps best known for popularizing the theological concept that God is not tied to the temple or to Jerusalem. For us, this is not groundbreaking theology. But for the Hebrew people, it was. They had imagined God as inhabiting the temple. God's glory was to be found there. If there was ever an issue too big for them, they would go to the temple and pray there. A priest would offer a sacrifice on their behalf. For a people whose origin story involved being called to wander the desert, having a house for God meant that there was stability. Then the God who had promised to be their protector forever, the God who was above all gods, somehow allowed the Babylonians to destroy his house and kidnap his people. This could not be an all-powerful God, could it? Because an all-powerful God could not be defeated. This part we can understand. We look around our sanctuary and miss those who used to fill it. We have made the difficult decision to take radical steps and follow God. The God we thought would never move us from our place of splendor. From the power of a congregation with plenty of money, plenty of workers, plenty of children and younger adults to do the work. <coughs> We have had to reorder our thinking about what it means to be church. We've had to alter our thinking even about what it means to be a Christian. We're no longer the majority faith in America. And we ask God, why? Why have we been abandoned and why is Babylon ruling over us? Why are the remnant so few and so powerless? Ezekiel received a word from God. He saw a vision of God in a chariot leaving Jerusalem, leaving the temple and following the people to Babylon. God had not abandoned them. God has opened a new way to follow God's commands. God has breathed new life into the people. And while that new breath hurt, it provided a way forward despite what seemed to be an overwhelming negative experience. The Spirit of God traveled into exile with the people of God because God will never leave us nor forsake us. Regardless of how the desert threatens to change us, regardless of where God calls us, there is nothing in heaven or on earth or under the earth that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That new heart that Ezekiel tells us God will give us is born in the trials of life. That new heart of flesh that is as tender and full of compassion as God's own heart is found as we follow God's call to enter the desert. If we fight against that call, 
we will wound ourselves in ways we cannot imagine. But if we relent and we let God take us into that time of discernment, we will be changed. Not like the fitness gurus who promise us a new body in 30 days if we eat enough broccoli and drink our protein powder. No. We'll be changed like Christ was changed in the desert. We will come away with our spirits revived by doing the will of God. We will rise up with a heart capable of loving others. We will walk in newness of life with compassion for ourselves. And for that, all the world will say, thanks be to God. Amen.